The Juno World Affairs Council presents Cyber War and Warfare with Lawrence Husick. Husick is a computer programmer, lawyer, and scholar of terrorism and counterterrorism at the Foreign Policy Research Institute, a think tank based in Philadelphia. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here. This evening, I hope to cover with you a little bit of the topic of cyber threats and why we should all be concerned about them. In this new world of cyber everything, we need to consider the complexities of the systems that we use and that control almost every aspect of our daily lives. And so let's start really at the end. And the end is that we've been warned you see, back in 1999, an official of the Department of Defense did tell us that the threat we faced was going to be electronic Pearl Harbor. And what he said was that, unlike Pearl Harbor, the attack would not be against a military installation, but rather it would be against our commercial infrastructure. He was not wrong. And so that warning should have, as so many other things, have been a wake-up call. If that weren't enough, our friends in the People's Liberation Army of China also gave us a wake-up call when two colonels published a book in English called Unrestricted Warfare. And even today, you can buy your very own copy of this book on Amazon.com. In this book, the two colonels told us that in case of war, China would execute cyber war against the United States. And the two colonels told us specifically the tools that the Chinese would use. They told us about computer viruses, worms, other kinds of malware, about financial manipulations, direct cyber attacks on our infrastructure. But what we failed to recognize in 1999 is that the very definition of war was not shared between the United States and China. And so increasingly, we have faced such digital intrusions it's just the nature of the game, and a big game it is. So the question I'm often faced with is, what is cyber war? And every expert to whom I've ever turned says, we just can't agree on what that would be. It's a variety of things. It's really the entire panoply of disrupting computer and network systems. The objectives differ, the techniques differ, but really, cyber is just a way of saying computers and networks. And so we're faced with wondering just how safe are those computers and networks that we use. If we can't agree on what cyber war might be, the bigger problem is that we also don't agree on whether we can even have something called cyber defense. Because in order to have defense, you have to know who you're defending against and where they are and what their objectives are. And these things are very difficult to discern in the cyber age. This is an example of a report that was generated by a security company tracking something called the advanced persistent threat coming out of China. And you can see that over a period of years, tremendous numbers of computer systems all over the world, and not coincidentally, not in China, were attacked with this threat. Huge amounts of information were siphoned out of computer systems all over the world. All of it has been traced back to this building in the Pudong district of Shanghai, where one unit of cyber warriors working for the Chinese People's Liberation Army is employed. And over a very long period, this group of cyber warriors managed to steal so much information that we can't even catalog it all. If you were wondering why the latest Chinese stealth fighter aircraft looks so much like the US F-22, you have only to look at the fact that the Chinese stole a vast amount of information from military contractors in the United States. And yet, when caught the cyber equivalent of red-handed, by tracing the computer addresses back to this very building, 
the Chinese Ministry of Defense responded as most do in this field by issuing a statement that said that that report tracing the source of the advanced persistent threat to that building lacked technical proof. And they went on, just in case you didn't understand, to say, we don't understand the definition of what this hacking really is. Oh, and by the way, everybody does it anyway. And so this is the response that President Obama got when he went to the President of China and said, in effect, cut it out. Now it didn't help that days before President Obama made that command to the President of China, Mr. Snowden had told us what the NSA was doing to the rest of the world, which I will tell you pales in comparison. And so, stepping back for a moment to understand the threat, no matter what it's called, whether it's cyber spying, or cyber crime, or cyber war, all of these things share tools and techniques completely in common. What differs about these labels is the objective. And so, for instance, in cybercrime, the objective is money. It's your credit card or your bank account. In cyber espionage, the objective is information. Whether that information is secured information, in the case of hacking against companies, or public information taken from public databases and painstakingly reassembled, all of that information goes into a vast network of underground information brokering. And finally, for cyber war or cyber terrorism, the objective is the same. It is disruption. Disruption to achieve a military or a political objective. Now that we understand what's going on and how much commonality there is, the question I'm often asked is, well, during the Cold War, we threatened to obliterate the Russians. If they should strike us, why can't we just do that? Well, the strategy that we use successfully in the Cold War is called MAD. And that's not without some irony. It's, multi, it's mutually assured destruction. It's the idea that if a first strike were to come, we would retain a second strike capability sufficient to barbecue half the planet. Not exactly the best sounding idea. But that relies on having a return address for the missiles that are launched at us. And in the new world of cyber, and in fact in the new world of terrorism, the terrorists and the cyber crooks don't give us a return address. And so my colleagues and I at the Foreign Policy Research Institute have termed this strategic stance MUD, both because it's clear as mud and because it stands for multilateral unconstrained disruption. Multilateral because it's everybody, state and non-state actors alike, commercial, private, you name it. Unconstrained because it doesn't seek to target just military targets. It goes after everyone, every system, all the time. And disruption because its objective is not total destruction. It is just to disrupt someone to change their course or mind. And so knowing that strategic stance helps us to understand the cyber threat. Now the cyber threat is most pronounced in an area of computing that we rarely see and rarely hear about. Something called the Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition Networks, SCADA for short. These are all of the little computers that control all of the things that we take for granted. In a building like this, the light switches aren't really light switches, they're signals to a computer system that say, turn on a light, turn off a light, dim a light, or even turn on a light across the building completely unconnected to this switch. The thermostats are not really thermostats, they're tiny computers measuring the temperature many times a second and talking to a master building control computer over a network. Our telephones, well, they don't have copper wires anymore, your voice is being digitized into ones and zeros, bounced off of satellite, shipped through fiber optic cables, and a call from here to your next door neighbor may well be routed through three foreign countries. We just can't tell. 
The problem with all of these little control computers is that they were designed and installed in a period of time when we didn't think security was worth worrying about. They're old. They were cheap. They work efficiently. But they can't necessarily be retrofit with security, and the threat here is not that somebody will blow them up. It's that they'll be co-opted into doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. And that threat causes disruption. It causes chaos. Now, how do we know that this is possible? Well, we know quite easily it's possible because of Stuxnet. And the picture you're seeing here is former Iranian President Ahmadinejad, about 300 feet underground at a nuclear enrichment facility. And those silver cylinders beside him, those are centrifuges that are used to spin uranium hexafluoride to make first medical grade and then weapons grade fissile material. What does this have to do with SCADA computing systems? Well, in an effort to slow down or perhaps entirely stop the Iranian nuclear program, there was a worm called Stuxnet. Now the real name of that program, run by the US and Israeli governments together, was Olympic Games. And our National Security Agency and the IDF, Israeli Defense Force Unit 8200, cooperated to build this first cyber-guided missile. Here's what they did. They knew that they had to slow down the ability of Iran to enrich uranium, to keep it from reaching a point where it could build a nuclear weapon. And so they launched this cyber worm through a variety of techniques, and they got it into the secure facilities that Iran was running. Once it was installed on the computers there in a fairly circuitous way, that cyber worm first looked around the network and said, what kind of computers are here? And when it found the computers that would control the speed of those centrifuges, it installed itself and then it went to sleep. It didn't do anything overt for a period. But it watched. And it watched for the speed of the centrifuge tube to rev up to a point where it was running somewhere between 810 and 1210 revolutions per minute. What this told our engineers is that the uranium had been spinning long enough that the batch was just about done. And in order to make enriched uranium, you have to use cascades of these centrifuges. The uranium has to go through one and spin for weeks and months, and then that enriched uranium goes to another centrifuge, and it spins in turn for weeks and months. This is a long process. The question was, at which point would you like to disrupt it? And so, once it saw that speed, the Stuxnet worm went back to sleep for about 13 days. When it woke up, it started monkeying with the speed of the centrifuge tube. The first thing it did was it sped it up to a speed of just over 1,400 revolutions per minute. And it held it there for a little while, and then it slammed on the brakes and slowed it all the way down to two revolutions per minute. All the while, this Stuxnet code was busy hiding itself so that when things started to go wrong inside this facility and the engineers interrogated their computer consoles and said, what's going on? The Stuxnet worm itself reported back, everything's fine here. And then it went back to its dastardly work. When it finished speeding them up and slowing them down and slamming them here and there, it went back to sleep for a while. Remember, it's hidden. Now, what happens when all of this speeding up and slowing down goes on? Well, we learned from an analysis at Oak Ridge that if you take one of these centrifuges, called a P1 centrifuge, P1 because it was the first model designed by the Pakistanis who gave it to the Iranians, if you speed it up to about 1,400 revolutions per minute, the vibrations will tear it apart. That's pretty good. You disable a very expensive piece of equipment. If that doesn't work, slamming on the brakes, taking it down to two revolutions per minute, will cause all of the safety systems to kick in and those safety systems use a vacuum and evacuate all of the uranium from the centrifuge and throw it away. This is like waiting until 
the cookie batch is just about ready to go in the oven, and then, forgive the analogy, spitting on all the cookies. Not a good thing. Now, how do we know it worked? Well, we know that Iran built in excess of 10,000 P1 centrifuges, and that after the Stuxnet worm struck in late 2010, they were running fewer than 3,700 of them, and we had calculated that it took about 10,000 centrifuges for Iran to make enough material to have the capability of making a nuclear weapon. This was very successful. So successful that when the Iranians finally figured out what we had done, and they didn't figure out who had done it, they just figured out there was this code interfering, they put out a call on the internet offering half a million dollars to a hacker who would come and help them clean out all their computers. The next day, messages started popping up on hacker boards on the internet from an anonymous source which said, we don't think your life is worth $500,000. This wouldn't be a good job to take. The Iranians who tried to clean out the computer systems met with a very terrible end as anonymous assailants on motorcycles attached magnetic bombs to the sides of their cars and drove away. All in all, it took the Iranians more than nine months to clean out the computer systems and restart them. And by that time, they were pretty clear that they had done a good job and they were going to restart the centrifuges that remained and build new ones and resume the nuclear program. And then, at about three in the morning on a July evening, every single computer in the deep underground secret Iranian nuclear facility started playing a song by ACDC. <laughs> this is the hacker equivalent of saying to somebody, not only don't you know what I can do, you don't even know what you don't know that I can do. <laughs> the ultimate tweak. So why am I telling you this? The message is simple. Code can destroy physical objects. And if you think of how much code runs our lives every day, you see what I'm getting at. The fallout from Stuxnet is, however, less clear. The first thing that you should know is that by this looking around networks, the US NSA and the Israelis now have a map of just about every industrial computer network in half the world. This allows us to build more precisely guided cyber weapons, weapons that are capable of attacking one and only one facility. The other thing to know is that once this stuff leaks out on the internet, it doesn't take long for people to take it apart, study it, and figure out how it works, and then repurpose it. And so that means that the bad guys are never more than half a step behind the good guys. That's dangerous. We should have expected that there would be some blowback in the cyberspace once the world figured out that it was the United States launching offensive cyber attack. And sure enough, that has happened. Saudi Aramco, the largest oil company in the world, was attacked in 2012 by an insider who put a piece of code on their Windows machines that was so malicious that over 30,000 machines had to be completely dumped. The code could not be removed. That code went on to spread to Rasgas in Qatar and destroy an additional 7,800 machines, and it still occasionally floats around in the Middle East today. Now, we think that that came as a response by the Iranians. There have been other attacks, and we should have expected them. So for instance, an Iranian-affiliated group, a non-governmental but perhaps government-sponsored group called the Qassam Cyberfighters, has gone after banks in the West, principally in the US and in the UK. And they do so using something called a distributed denial of service attack. This is when a computer is issued so many requests to do something that it simply runs out of memory, stalls, and falls offline. 
And in this case, the Qassam cyber fighters were not terribly sophisticated. They went on to the internet and they downloaded a piece of code called It's OK, No Problem, Bro, which is capable of flooding a website at over 70 gigabits per second. Compare that to the speed of your home internet, you'll see this is a big number. Now the Syrian Electronic Army picked up on this and started using the same thing. And they are also not Syrian government. They're somehow affiliated with and supported by the Syrian government. And we have seen other attacks as well. The Syrians also did something that I think is very clever. And that is they didn't bother actually attacking websites. All they did was call up the organizations, pretending to be somebody from a service provider, and asking for the organization's passwords. Once they had the passwords, they grabbed the websites and redirected them to terrorist websites. Pretty classy. It should also tell you that if someone calls you at dinner time and asks for your password, you should probably hang up. Now, in addition to these government-sponsored groups, we also have to worry about something called hacktivism. Hacktivism is a loosely defined term that means that there are some people who think that they can write injustices as they view them by the hacking techniques of the internet. And we've seen these groups emerge over time. The biggest, most famous of them is Anonymous. Anonymous is famous for going after real civil injustices where they see them. So they've gone after things as diverse as the WikiLeaks problem and Chelsea Manning, who is presently in Leavenworth, and also the problem of alleged rapes in Steubenville, Ohio, carried out by members of the football team and countenanced by just about everybody up to the mayor. And Anonymous isn't done yet. They're going after people in Camden, New Jersey, across the river from where I live, because a man in custody of the police died there, and the police said, we don't know what happened. There are other groups that are not quite so high-minded, and they have wonderful names, like Loft Heavy Industries and the Cult of the Dead Cow and so forth. Some of them hack for fun and profit, others just for fun, because they're just looking to prove who's a better hacker. And yet, all of these are threats to lots of different organizations. Organizations including, for instance, law firms. Because a law firm representing a Marine sergeant in a court martial, in which he was accused of murdering some civilians in Afghanistan, had all of its files stolen from its computer network and revealed on the internet just because they were defending the Marine, as he had a right to expect. And so we face these actors as well. So one of the questions that I'm often asked is, we know all about this, so what are we doing about it? Where are we? Why isn't this a higher priority? Well, here I'm afraid that I'm the bearer of some bad news. 95% of the systems out there in the United States aren't governmentally operated. And what that means is that the government has no right to dictate how security is established or maintained, or how those systems are configured, or when they're retired, for instance. So there are lots of people who think, if there is a massive cyber attack, the secret government cyber force will arrive dressed in black fatigues, roping down from black helicopters to save us. I'm sorry to tell you, there is no secret government cyber force, and they will not save us. This is a private sector problem. It's a problem for each one of us that has a PC, a tablet, a smartphone, a smart thermostat, or works in a building with smart controls, or drives on a street where the traffic lights are controlled by SCADA computers. Unfortunately, the news gets worse, because most PCs today run Windows. And as the government has found, you can't secure Windows for love or money. It's simply insecure. And there's no patch you can put on it that will make it more secure. Now, is it getting better? Yes. If you run Windows 10, and I hear most people really are unhappy with this idea because it doesn't run on most of the computers you now own. But if you run Windows 10, it's got some pretty good near state-of-the-art security. 
earlier stuff? Well, here we go. Windows XP, the most common version of Windows in the world, is no longer supported and there are no longer security patches available for it. Zero, zip, none. It's not just that it's not patched, it's that when the bad guys discover yet another vulnerability in it, Windows XP is present in lots of these SCADA control systems. And they're not being patched either to protect them. Office 2003 is another point of vulnerability and it's not being supported with security updates. Running Windows 7 or Vista and think you're any better? Nope. Windows support has ceased for those, although for 7, some security patches will continue to be made available through 2020. Some, but not all. There are now well over 75 million different pieces of what we call computer malware. That's computer worms and viruses and other types of stuff that do bad things to computer systems. The computer security firm Symantec catalogs hundreds of millions of virus unique signatures. So if you run antivirus software on your computer and you're wondering why your computer is getting slower, it's because every new file has to be checked against hundreds of millions of different signatures before the software will say that file is okay. Compound that with what I call the herd immunity deficiency. And that is that at present, 17% of all legitimate PCs, that is, PCs running bought software rather than pirated software, 17% of them have no protection whatsoever. No antivirus, no firewall, they are wide open. Now, from time to time, I conduct an experiment, which I liken to the tribal process on Borneo of taking a pig and staking it out in a clearing and waiting for the Komodo dragons to attack, I take a brand new PC and I put it unprotected on the internet. Usually it takes less than 25 seconds for it to be attacked. And it is usually fully compromised within two minutes. And this has only been accelerating over the years. Add to that the fact that malware seems to be an exponential problem. We have more and more of it every year. And as I said, our SCADA networks and controllers generally cannot be retrofit with new security. They have to be ripped out and replaced. So how do you think the mayor of Philadelphia reacted when I told him that every system for controlling water, sewage, gas, and traffic lights needed to be ripped out from the roots and replaced at a cost of over three billion dollars. That's right, he laughed. It simply is beyond our comprehension. Now one of the questions is, why do we keep putting this stuff on the internet? What you're seeing here is a world map where every non-black dot is a control system that's been connected to the internet for some reason and is sitting out there completely visible. These control systems run, as I said, from water and sewer controls to gas line <coughs> controls to industrial controls. A number of years ago, all rail traffic in the United States east of the Mississippi was halted for 14 hours. Why? Because the managers at CSX, the freight rail company, wanted to know the status of all of their trains and they wanted to be able to find that out from their home computers. And so when one of those home computers got a virus, and that virus invaded the CSX control network, they were suddenly rendered blind. The entire network couldn't tell where the trains were or if they were stationary or moving or what track they were on, and the only way to sort it out was to send out a call that everybody needed to stay in place for 14 hours until we got the systems back up. And this has repeated itself time and time again. We connect systems to the internet for convenience, only to find out that they become vulnerable. In August of 2003, most of the Northeast United States was blacked out for a period of three days. Although not directly responsible for the blackout, that was due to a sagging power line and a tree that hadn't been cut, 
The fact that the blackout spread was because the control room computers in the grid had been infected with a computer worm that made them slow down to the point where the operators could no longer trust the readouts. They were, in effect, blinded. You would think that the systems computers on offshore oil rigs are about as far from the internet and this threat as you can possibly get, but you'd be wrong. Because in the oil and gas industry, living out on the rigs, lonely, people tend to bring those little memory sticks with them loaded with, well, music and other things. Among the other things, malware. Malware that has the capability of shutting down a rig or, as I said, worse yet, interfering with its operation, causing a catastrophic failure. And cleaning this stuff out is notoriously difficult and expensive. So the question remains, is this war? Well, a number of years ago, an anonymous general at the Pentagon told the Wall Street Journal, if you shut down our power grid, maybe we'll put a missile down one of your smokestacks. Now, I monitor a bunch of hacker boards, and within minutes, the response came. And this was it. Lulz, which means I'm laughing at you. We have zero smokestacks, dude. A fundamental disconnect. As the generals in the Pentagon thought that they had a return address for the cyber bad guys, only to find out that that address had been spoofed, that they really didn't know where the attack was coming from. They couldn't attribute it. There was nowhere to launch the missiles at. Now, just when you thought this was all doom and gloom, here we go again. Because Ashton Carter, the US Secretary of Defense, announced the fourth major change in cyber strategy just last week. And this change in cyber strategy, put in a nutshell, says, there may be some instances in which we decide to use cyber weaponry to strike back at an adversary rather than those missiles, or in addition to those missiles. Now, he, of course, didn't say what those conditions are, precisely how we would decide, how we would know who the bad guys were in the first place, and how we would launch an attack. And when questioned about that, he said, people should know that the United States is fully capable and should fear us. I think Stuxnet proves the point, but we haven't seen the pace of cyber attack slow since the world learned about Stuxnet. This is really what I think is going on. Rather, it's the Pentagon trying to figure out how to use the missiles of the last war in order to fight the conflicts of the next. It's often said that we always fight the last war, and I'm afraid that this is not very different. So how vulnerable is the United States? Well, the Pentagon did a self-assessment of our nuclear weapons strike force and concluded, in a nutshell, we don't know if it's secure. We can't guarantee that it is. And in order to be able to answer those questions in the affirmative, it will take us half a billion dollars and five years of hard work. In other words, we can't be sure that the missiles would go up if they were needed, or if they went up, that they would come down in the designated places. This is a truly scary Dr. Strange Lovian kind of world. The White House has responded by stepping in where Congress feared to tread. After four years of trying to work on cybersecurity, the Senate finally threw up its arms, filibustered, and walked away. And the White House, as a result, first gave us an executive order to the that established the National Institutes of Standards and Technology as an aspirational goal to provide frameworks for cybersecurity. And more recently, in the wake of the Sony hack attributed to North Korea, the White House has promulgated an executive order that says if you commit a cyber attack against us and it's serious, we'll freeze your assets, your financial assets, of which North Korea has precisely none in the United States. But at least it's a start. So where do we go from here? Well, I think it's beyond question that cyber threats are here to stay, that we will see them used in any future conflict. 
We have certainly seen them used around the world in conflicts not involving the United States, conflicts involving Russia and its neighbors, Estonia, Georgia, more recently Ukraine. We'll also see that security technologies fail to keep pace, that this is a cat and mouse game and that often the cat will win and the mouse will lose. And that any defense based on the ability to deter an attack rather than to survive an attack is ultimately futile because our ability to quickly identify and attribute an attack is still in its infancy. It is growing. We do have a cyber force. They're not there yet. So in conclusion, it's apparent that cyber threats are just threats like any others. They just happen to employ computers and networks. There really aren't any differences that are significant among the various types of cyber threat. The people who go after your credit card numbers as cyber criminals could turn around tomorrow and become cyber terrorists. It's all the same tools. Cyber threats are highly asymmetric. That is, the people who launch them need very few resources. The people who must defend against them have to be right all the time. Retaliation is usually not possible. And in our private sector, the computers that we all use and carry around in our pockets, we're either playing catch up badly or not at all. This is a job that we need to take seriously. Because as I said, we've been warned. And the most recent warning came when DHS Secretary Napolitano departed her job. And in her last speech, she said, this is going to threaten lives and the functioning of our society. So what are we to do? Well, we have developed systems that are called trusted computing. Computing systems and software that can not only be trusted, but are themselves trustworthy. And yet, we continue not to deploy these systems. Why? Because they are more complicated and more expensive than the quick and dirty systems we're all used to. And we all look for the best price in every piece of equipment we buy. So this is a commons problem. It's a problem that we all share in common, but which calls upon each of us to make an individual investment. An investment in systems that we use personally, an investment in paying slightly higher utility bills so that the utilities can protect themselves, an investment in being willing to see the government do the right thing and allow the government to help guide the effort and coordinate this common effort. And this goes against the grain of a lot of our political thinking today. But we face an enemy that is large, getting larger, persistent, incredibly persistent, and potentially deadly. And so I want to encourage all of us to ask for trusted computing systems, to vote with our wallets to use such systems, to employ encryption on devices so that it's harder to break in and get the information in the first place. Most of your smartphones today come with an option to turn on a password, and that can turn on encryption and protect your information. And yet fewer than th one third of us ever turn that on because it's inconvenient. It's our job. It's our job to tell our leaders that it's their job and that we'll support them. And I look forward to all of your questions and concerns. If you have a question, please come to the mic. Could you talk a little more about what the private sector is doing in the country in terms of maybe more systematically, sector by sector, uh, to deal with protecting uh, national infrastructure? Absolutely. Well, the first thing to note is that the United States government has a number of what they call sectors that are within something called critical infrastructure. And so energy is one, water is one, transportation is one. And each one of these sectors it, it comprises a partnership between government and private companies and individuals seeking to come up with standards that will improve security, resilience, sustainability, and so forth. 
The important thing to note here is that government has no mandate power in any of these things. And so, for instance, to pick on one that's just a favorite of mine since I'm a chemist, the chemical industry told the government back in 2002, you don't have to regulate us, we will self-impose regulations that protect our facilities. But when it comes right down to it, what the industry has usually done is buy insurance rather than prevent the occurrences. And you can buy a lot of insurance and that will protect the venture itself. You can even buy business interruption insurance. The question becomes, what if your facility makes something that's critical to the supply chain that the, company, that the country depends upon? Years ago, I identified one chemical plant in Pennsylvania that made 80% of the world's supply of a completely anonymous little chemical. Yes, the chemical was poisonous, and they had taken the right steps to be sure that it didn't leak out of the plant. But my study concluded that if the plant were to be destroyed, the worldwide semiconductor industry would take four years to recover. Now, if you think about it, semiconductors are kind of important. If you go buy a new car today, your car has at least 25 different computer chips in it that control everything from the throttle to the brakes to the radio to the nav system, even to moving the seat backward, forward, up and down, and pumping up the lumbar support. In fact, your car has a bus in it through which all these computers communicate. So if I destroy the worldwide semiconductor market for a couple of years, I would say that's a terrorist attack. And yet, there's no way that this individual company could insure the worldwide semiconductor market. The only way to do it was to ensure resilience, which meant you'd have to bring another plant online somewhere else and have it as a backup. And maybe that was run by a competitor. And we run into all sorts of legal problems in that because we have things called antitrust laws. You can see this spirals into confusion very quickly. Now, the private sector is doing some things, and one of the things I like to point to is what Apple has done, which, by the way, has made the FBI really unhappy. Apple has said, by default, we're going to encrypt all of our iPhones, all the data on them. We don't know how to get at it. If the user of that phone won't give you the password, too bad. The head of the FBI has gone before Congress and said, this is a bad thing, Apple should not do it. Some child is going to die because we can't get into an iPhone. And this is precisely the wrong approach. The right approach is to say, we should all protect our own data very strongly because the more of us protect our data, the less chance there is of a bad guy using it because that's the real threat. So there are some private companies that are doing or trying to do the right thing. Believe me, it's swimming upstream against a pretty strong current. The government is trying to protect critical infrastructure, but I can give you a list of 20 things that aren't considered critical, but should be. So we are again back playing very bad catch up. Thanks for the question. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for coming to Juno and being with us and sharing this information. I've learned a lot. It's kind of scary. Um, I travel a lot for business and pleasure, and I'm concerned about how safe our airlines are. I've read some pretty spooky things, and um, I just like your take on how safe it is to be up in the air flying around. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent question. Modern airliners are just about the safest way that you can travel. My wife doesn't like hearing this, but statistically, you run hundreds of times more probability of being injured or killed on the drive to the airport than you do flying across the world. That being said, you might have read last week that a security researcher was denied boarding on a flight because he tweeted that it was too easy to connect a computer under your seat and gain access to the flight control systems of that airplane. Well, that's a really interesting result because that security researcher has been publishing detailed articles about exactly that problem for the last four years out of frustration with the fact that for the four years before that, he was talking privately to the industry and the FAA and no one was listening and no one was doing anything. What's he talking about? Well, he's talking about the fact that modern airplanes have only one data bus 
for the entire airplane. That one data bus interconnects all of the flight control systems, everything that goes on in the cockpit and the avionics bay, and coincidentally, all of those little screens on the back of your seat that you use to watch movies or play games or order food. And what he was saying is, look, there's an access port under the seat on the little box that runs that screen. And once you gain access to that, you can watch all of the messages going back and forth on that bus. And perhaps, he didn't say you could, but perhaps you could affect those messages in some way. Now what he was saying was that there has never been a lock invented that couldn't be picked by someone. And this is gospel among computer security people. There's always a way in. And his question was, why do we need all of these entertainment screens on the same bus that flies the airplane? And again, here's the answer. Because the airplane was designed to be sold to the airline cheaply. And putting a second bus on it reduces the profit of the people who sell the airplane. And unless someone comes along and says, this is important. We need to isolate these systems fully and completely. They can't talk to each other. The manufacturer has no good reason to do it. Now, I have full faith that that Boeing aircraft has all of the state-of-the-art isolation between what the entertainment system sees and what the pilot can do. I have no doubt about that. I think it's completely safe. But I will also tell you that I've never seen a computer system that a determined hacker cannot affect in some way. Even if he can't get into it, think of the probability of simply flooding the bus with messages using that little kit called, it's okay, no problem, bro. And what happens when I put 70 gigabits of information across that bus? How fast does that pilot system respond now? Now, I think denying boarding and threatening the messenger with arrest for publishing the information is exactly the wrong thing to do. So to sum up, yes, I fly all the time. I'm completely confident in it. I don't think you shouldn't fly. I think we have the wrong response when we take people who honestly have been trying to bring this message home, that we are at risk, that we ought to take this seriously, that we ought to act, and instead we tell them, no, you can't get on this airplane. Sir. My question would be about how's the financial industry doing with this? A few years ago, we had a thing called the flash crash that was caused by a, a trader in London who was basically, he, he wasn't trying to be a terrorist, he was just trying to make some money. And he met, was able to manipulate a, a market by putting in a bunch of buy orders, and then and then once the other 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 market participants responded to these, he canceled them all, and then he was able to make a killing by doing that. Now it seems to me that somebody that, that that's the sort of thing that if somebody were to to do it with markets, you could and do it really seriously, you could have a, have a really major crash. And I'm just wondering how, the, how you see the financial industry is, is keeping this sort of thing from happening, because after all, we're all here mostly retired, and we kind of depend on that. <laughs> Excellent question. The flash crash was a symptom of the speed with which trading can be done using automated systems and the speed with which certain signals can be interpreted from outside the market. So for instance, a lot of people think that the flash crash was accelerated because there were some bot softwares that were sitting there and reading people's tweets and interpreting those as the mood of the market. And let me tell you, there's nothing quite as scary as programming a computer system and then watching it do exactly what you programmed it to do at speeds that are completely unimaginable so that it ends up doing precisely the wrong thing. Everybody who's ever studied introductory programming knows that feeling as 3,000 pages spit out of the printer because you forgot to terminate the loop. Mm -hmm. These systems are really difficult to predict. The systems themselves become so complex that they begin to look almost intelligent. 
And that's the problem. Because unless you can take that system and test it so that deterministically you can state it won't do something bad, you'd better have some levers that you can pull very quickly and some watchdogs that can help. The problem that we have is we don't have those levers and watchdogs. And so we are still as susceptible to those kinds of manipulations and mistakes as we've ever been. The only hope is that once it happens, we have some regulatory muscle that can declare everything stopped and then order everybody back to starting positions without too much disruption. It's not clear that you can do that with 100% reliability, but it is clear that at least in the United States, the regulatory agencies, the oversight agencies on the markets have the power to send everybody back to square one if need be. And that's what we hope they'll do. Okay, thank you. Certainly. Hello, marvelously interesting. Thank I want you. to ask about our government's capability in the computer realm. Um, it's a very human endeavor, and a lot of it comes down to computer programming and programmers, and there's only so many really good programmers, and I imagine it is a classic pyramid. There's a lot of mediocre programmers, and you know, at the apex, there's the really good guys that could either do bad or, or do good. Um, I don't know how successful we are these days at turning out computer programmers. I mean, there's a jillion and one people that are getting BAs in, quote, computer science. That doesn't put you at the top. Um, so how is the government, I don't know what, it's a, it's a huge question, but um, how are they recruiting and how are they organizing and how are they managing this whole body of people that has to really do the work in, in many different aspects. Um, some of them are terrorizing other companies and some are defending and some are cybering and I mean it, you know, it's way, way over my head but I guess the fundamental I'm trying to get to is how is our government doing at just being in the business of doing what it needs to do in cyber? That's a great question and I think I can illustrate where we've come with a brief story. Shortly after September 11, 2001, it was determined within the NSA that we really needed a force of hackers who could help defend the country. And the NSA went out and hired a bunch of these guys off the street. Several months later, the Bush administration got wind of the fact that these people had been hired and that most of them had some form of criminal record and promptly fired them all. Now, we are not there anymore. The National Security Agency recruits from top engineering schools and universities and has all the toys in the world and pays people appropriately to retain them and trains them well, and they are absolutely at the top of the game worldwide. No one comes close. The United States Air Force has stood up Cyber Command, and Cyber Command has the job of protecting us. And although their recruitment lags, we're beginning to see that pipeline filled. Three years ago, Janet Napolitano publicly stated the Department of Homeland Security was going to hire a thousand cybersecurity experts in the next year. I don't think they got to 200 because they don't have the right stuff there to attract and retain people yet. And yet we've just stood up a cyber coordination center within DHS and funded it and with any luck within a couple of years it will get going and get revved up to the point where it too can function to coordinate all of these different agencies. Now the really good news is that there is a national competition that is held every year for high school students where those students are tasked 
as part of the competition with defending a computer next network against professional attackers. <coughs> That's an amazing thing. And when students ask me, what should I go to school for? What's a great career? My answer is cybersecurity. Ultimate satisfying job, highly, highly compensated. The bad guys are going to be attractive to some folks, but the community has really turned to the point where we respect the good hackers. Uh, enough of the bad guys have landed in jail or worse that the cost-benefit ratios are reversing, shall we say. And so I think the government is doing the right thing, and it's slowly getting to the point where we need them to be. I think it will probably take another five to ten years before we really are rolling in this and, and attain the excellence across all sectors of the government that we see in NSA, but I'm confident that we'll be able to do it. I want to thank you all this evening. It's been a great pleasure being with you, and this has been an excellent session. If you still have some questions, I encourage you to email them to me at the address that you've seen on the screen, and I will do my best to answer each and every one of them. Good evening. That was Lawrence Husick in this Juno World Affairs Council presentation, produced in collaboration with 360 North. It was recorded April 29, 2015 at 360 in Juno, with support from GCI, Alaska Electric Light and Power Company, Wastman and Associates Incorporated, Core Alaska Incorporated, Hecla Greens Creek Mining Company, Sea Alaska, and Alaska Power and Telephone.